So how did you end up deciding going to Penn State to college? Were there a lot of teams recruiting you? Um, I'd say I was probably um, a middle of the road uh, recruit. I um, wasn't, you know, I was, I was uh, obviously I, I had I had attention, but not to the high level. But you know, being from Pennsylvania, I think people. Um, I wasn't a real college guy. You know, I was really uh, growing up. I was, I think, I always worked on weekends and, and was playing. And so Sunday was really the day I watched football. So really, I was more of an NFL fan growing up. So college wasn't. Um, Football wasn't something I watched a lot of, and uh, so people, because people thought naturally I was at Penn State, that that was where I always wanted to go, and, and it really wasn't. I knew of Penn State, obviously. I knew of Coach Paterno, I knew of its great reputation, but I wasn't. Um, I didn't know where I wanted to go or what the future held for me. And, and to be honest with you, even when I was in high school, um, I was, I'm one of those guys that just enjoyed what I enjoyed the moment, and never really. I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen when I was a senior, as far as if I was going to have attention for a scholarship or not have one. And, so I start getting letters my junior year, you know, handful of letters of interest in me playing football for college. And I think that's when it hit me, you know, at the end of my junior year that I have an opportunity maybe to get a scholarship uh, to continue in football. And I was one of those tweener guys where I, I wasn't sure, you know, my height and weight and what position I really would play. It wasn't an obvious thing like that, I, what position I'd be playing even when I went to college. So, um, you know, then my senior year, I, I, you know, I, you know, I heard from Penn State, I heard from some other teams. And then, you know, took my visits and, um, you know, took my five or six visits and, and, and the process began. Was Joe Paterno recruiting you or was it one of the assistant coaches? Um, obviously one of the assistants. And then, um, you know, my sister was going to Penn State at the time. And, you know, Penn State was only a couple hours away. So um, I knew if I wanted to go, um, so I went for the visit. They, they, you know, one, one of the uh, assistant coaches had called me to set up a, a visit. I went out there in the fall during my senior year for a visit, or I guess it was right after the, my, probably in January for a visit uh, to Penn State. And uh, that's when I first met Coach Paterno was at the, uh, with the dinner uh, when they had all the recruits that are in town, you know, every 15, 20 guys in. And, you know, you have a weekend, a short weekend uh, there at Penn State to get a feel for what it's like. And, and really different than most of uh, visits. Um, you, know, you, go, you only go for one night versus two nights in most schools at back then. And you stay in the dorm room. Like you, you stay in a cot in a room with two football players, you know, and the players at Penn State at the time were, uh, there was no football dorm, no football, the players were spread around, around the campus like the regular students were, and they were in normal dorm rooms. And uh, so you basically had a rollout cot and he wanted to see experience what you're really getting yourself into if you came to Penn State, which was unique versus, because most schools I visited, you know, you're, you're in a hotel and it's a nice setup and you're, you're getting all that. And, and whereas at Penn state, it was, this is what we were all about. Here's how we do business. And here's what you can expect. You, know, you, get, a, you get a real good, um, a taste of college life for what it's going to be like in the dorms with, uh, not just all football players, but which I thought was kind of interesting. I kind of really, uh, actually liked that, um, that would, that angle of doing recruiting. And then obviously, you know, um, get a chance to spend time with the players in their way. And then obviously with the coaches and coach paternal. So then, the next day, meaning the Sunday before I left, is when I had my, you know, I had a chance to sit down with Coach Paterno and have my first real face-to-face -face meeting with him. So I was, you know, very, you know, scared to death for that meeting. And uh, as a you know, 18-year-old boy talking to a legend of Pennsylvania, so um, I'll always remember that, you know, sitting there and, and talking to him about my opportunity maybe of coming to Penn State. So um, and that, that, that meant a lot to me. What was he like, Coach Paterno, as a coach? Um, you know, I, I guess the first thing, I mean, should I mention about how, about going there, not going there? I mean, yeah. You know, cause I, I, um, you know, so when I was finally narrowing it down, you know, the signing day was coming in February and, uh, I had decided, um, that I was probably to go to a different school. So I, I let the, uh, the, um, the, the assistant coach, I called and let him know that I was probably going to go to a, um, a different school. And, I think that kind of surprised him. So he had asked me, hey, did you sign with anybody? I said, well, no, the signing date is, you know, a couple of weeks. No, I haven't done that yet. And he said, well, hold on a second. And he, he got Coach Return on the phone, which I was trying to avoid. Because, uh, you know, to say something like that, you know, I, you know, I just wanted to talk to the assistant. So he just said, hey, Mike, why don't you ask your mom and dad if it's okay if I uh, come over to the house tomorrow night? I'd like to come over and have dinner and uh, speak with you about all this. So obviously, um, um, who's going to say no to Coach Return will come over to your house? And, my parents were thrilled and excited as heck, and and so the next day their their coach was uh, you know at at the house and and had dinner with us and um, and uh, we talked you know I think the whole conversation was really not a whole lot about um, 
about me. It was about just he he found common ground with my parents probably on, on many many levels. And then uh, we talked, um, you know, then he asked for a couple minutes with me and we talked about, uh, uh, you know, my de- my decision on going to Penn State or not. And, you know, that's when I changed my mind that night. Um, you know, as far as making a decision, he could pretty much, I don't want to say challenged me, but he pretty much said uh, that, he, you know, he couldn't guarantee me that I'd ever play a down at football at Penn State, but he'd guarantee me that I'd have the, the best experience of my life and I would uh, come out of there with, uh, you know, a, a business degree of what, which I was working for. He can guarantee you that. And that, that if I had the talent uh, to play, that they would bring it out of me and bring out the best of me. And if I was afraid for that challenge, then maybe, um, you know, I, sh- you know I should, he shouldn't be sitting there offering me a scholarship. So it was a very um, motivating uh, talk and a very honest talk. And uh, when he left, I really gave some thought to what he had said. And I realized what he said to me is exactly what I wanted. I mean, I wanted to, what was most important to me was the education um, from a good, from a, from a good school, and was the challenge, was the ability to me to be the best I could be. Um, and I've, I've I've really bought into the fact that if anyone could do that, they could um, they could bring that out of me, just like you said. And so um, a couple of days later, I called the coach and changed my mind and said I wanted to come to Penn State. Did your parents push you for Penn State, or they basically let you make the decision? No, they. Um, I mean, you know, you, you know what your parents kind of want for you. I mean, I knew that they were. You know, you're from Pennsylvania. That's probably your, you know, a number one. Uh, you love to see your. You know, plus, I my my sister was already going to Penn State. My older sister Sue. And so, no, they they always been. Um, you know, they've always guided me, but always let me make my own decisions. And, and knowing that that was probably one of the biggest decisions of my life. I mean, that was my biggest decision in my life to that point, for sure. And I think they wanted to guide me, but not um, not direct me. And I've always appreciated that. And, uh, you know, yeah, I knew in the back of my mind what they probably would want. But, I, you know, I, but I still, the decision was mine. When I said I wasn't, I was thinking not of going to Penn State, they were all behind what I was thinking, like, what, you know, what my thoughts were and, I, you know, like I said, I think the coach paternal. I guess that's the best example I give of what coach paternal was like was the fact that he, you know, I don't know what number of recruit I was. I mean, they signed 25 back then. I think he signed 25 to 30 guys per class, and yeah, I'm sure I was in the middle of their class or the back end of the, maybe the 20 to 30 of their of their guys they signed that year. And I think the fact that he put the phone down and came to my house and had dinner with my parents and said the things he said to me in, in, not in a very positive but challenging way um, tells me all about w- what I was in for. And, and that's how he was when I got there, the honesty, the um, the discipline. I love, you know, the discipline, the way he ran the program, um, what he said he did. Um, and, he, and he taught you life's lessons a lot. Like just like that, t- that conversation in, my, in the house, I thought in front of the team, it was all about he always related uh, real life to football and knowing that, you know, football life, you know, most of us were only going to play the first conversation and there's a hundred players in there. And he, he made it very clear that some of you get most of you, you know, high percentage of the good guys in this room, you know, these next four years are going to be your last four years of football. They're going to be your best for football. They're going to be the best years of your life. But a lot of you aren't going to play football past these four years. And so you're here for obviously your, your education is your priority. And, you know, you need to leave with that education no matter what happens. And, uh, and that, and so I think he instilled that from day one, and he, and not just that in that first day. It's, it's weekly. There's always talk about life and and life's lessons, and maybe what we learned from the football game, not necessarily the fact that we didn't win, but what we learned by losing or not doing our best. Or so I thought that was very interesting how he found a way every week it seemed like win or lose to have to teach us something, and I thought that was um, very unique. And he always found a way to do it. I always thought it what a great speaker he was. And within the moment, uh, just, you know, just sitting into just the way he talks. So I think all that, other than the obvious football stuff and being part of that program and all that, I just, the other, the other things were, you know, from the time I made the decision that the day of my house to, you know, every week or, you know, when he'd be in front of us and the comments he'd make and what I learned from him. And, and like anything, when you leave there, I think you, you even appreciate it more, um, what he meant to the program, what he meant to us individually, what he taught me, um, you know, when I went to when I got drafted by the Oilers, and, and people we'd be at a function maybe with me and three or four other guys that came from different schools, and people would say, "Hey, uh, where are you from?" And, and then you know I'm from this school, I'm from that school. When I said Penn State, like they were like, "Whoa, what's Coach Paterno like?" Um, like you got a reaction, and I was down in Texas, so 
you realize what you were part of that type, that type of program and the fact that he was there so many years. Um, you know, I can meet a Penn State guy anywhere, an ex a player that played in any decade, and we could have similar stories. You know, we'd have similar feelings, and that that was kind of a nice bond. That was very um, fun. It was a nice fraternity to be part of. He was sometimes he was too honest. I remember Tony Dorsett telling me that Joe Paterno was recruiting him and told him he wanted to make him a cornerback, and Tony wanted to play running back. Whereas a lot of coaches would have just told Tony what he wanted to hear. And that was it. But again, Joe wasn't going to lie to the players. He was going to be honest with his recruits. Yeah, he was with me. I mean, I, I he didn't know what he actually said to me. I don't know where you're going to play. Like that day in my house, he said, "I'm not quite sure if you ever play. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what position you, you're even going to be, uh, but you're going to play." And when I got to Penn State, I mean, he, you know, he, it was I thought I was going to be a defensive player, and they had me on the offensive side from day one. And you know, I moved from tight end for a one day trial to tight end, tight end to defensive line to uh, offensive line to, you know, from tackle to guard to center. So uh, he moved me around and I, he does the same thing with a lot of players and, and uh, has a knack for finding the right fit for you. And it seemed like, um, yeah, cause I, I never got really what I wanted, but I got what I was supposed to get. Like it was, uh, you know, I, I thought I knew what I wanted, but I, I really didn't. And, and he let it happen, let the process happen and move me around position to position and, uh, by my, you know, this my beginning of my sophomore year, I found my home at offensive line, which I developed into, which I, if you told me I was going to be an offensive lineman coming out of high school, I never would have believed it. So um, I think a lot of guys have similar stories. And, yeah, I think he, he wanted what was best for you. And, he, you know, obviously he was him and his staff were very trained to, to do that, like I'm sure most colleges are. But uh, he had a knack of, like you said, he wasn't going to tell you something that uh, you wanted to hear. He's going to tell you what he felt the truth was. Who was your biggest rival when you were at Penn State? Uh, Pitt. I mean, that's that's the part I like about it, the fact that they're playing again. Um, Pitt, Penn State is um, – that's it's awesome. It was a Thanksgiving Day game. Um, you know, I, obviously I've heard you know, all the story. You know, like you just mentioned, uh, Tony Dorsett, and, you know, the, the tradition they had um, through the 70s when I – you know, same, if, if, as Penn State did in the 70s at, you know, at the time in the early 80s when we, when we were there. Um, that was the game. I mean, that was the game you waited for, you know, win the state battle East versus West. And, um, yeah, I thought it was, uh, yeah, that was the game. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, without doubt that was the, the big day and whether it be at our place Thanksgiving day or at their place. And I was just happy that, you know, that, uh, they start the rivalry up again. Cause a lot of people forgot that how strong that was and what a big game that was. Did you have any idea you were going to get drafted in the first round by the Oilers? Definitely not. Um, I was the same way I mentioned to you about high school when I was in college and I started playing offensive line. Um, when I heard that talk from Coach Paterno, it doesn't mean I didn't have dreams of someday playing in the NFL, but you know, I, I thought the same thing. Like, I'm going to enjoy these four years. I'm going to get the best out of my four years. And, and that's what I bought into when he was in my house, uh, that I was going to hold him to that. I wanted to, I wanted the degree in business. I wanted to, to make to, to play on play for Penn State, you know, and that's what I was honed into. So, I really didn't think about the NFL until probably what happens with a young player is that you see you see your teammates get drafted, and I think that's when I start thinking, you know, if if this guy can, you know if this guy can you know, get drafted in the NFL, one of my teammates, then heck, I you know I have a shot at this thing. And I think you, you know your junior year or whenever you start when that starts happening, you start realizing that if you can continue to develop, continue to play, continue to work hard, that you know, I have a chance to play in the next level. Like I, I can make it to the next level. So. I think I started, you know, as I learned, you know, because obviously I was, I was developing to an offensive lineman and had a long way to go uh, between gaining weight, gaining strength, learning the position. So a lot was happening in a short period of time for me. And so um, um, then I realized I was, by the time I got to my, as I started a couple of years and I realized I did have an opportunity um, to play. Now where I go and how, where I get drafted, no, that was not um, something I had any, any idea of how, that, how it was going to play out. Um, you know, when, when I became draft eligible. Does it kind of, you kind of think, you know what, if I could have played one more year at Penn State, I could have won a national championship. I just missed by one year. Yeah, I mean, and I had the option. I mean, I, you know, because I came out the year early. Um, yeah, you, you wonder, well, I knew what a good team we had. Um, you know, but I hurt my knee at Penn State and my, um, yeah, I started my sophomore season as at guard. Um, my freshman year, I was on special teams mainly. 
and uh, you know I, I was the bat, I was on the practice squads and things like that. So I didn't see the field as an offensive player until my sophomore year, and then my junior year, I started the whole sophomore year. And then my junior year, I, I um, injured my knee in spring spring training and had to miss the year and got redshirted. So I came back the next year, started the whole year. So I think you know, and, and I was back to feeling good again. But I think when you experience as a young man, I, I never been hurt before like that. Um, the injury and I, it just kind of spooked me a little bit. And then the fact that I was able to graduate in four years and I was able to um, get healthy and, you know, my, my, you know, my class was all graduating. I mean, my team was about everyone else were graduating. And so, yeah, I would, you, would I mean, I just thought the timing was, was right for me to, you know, I, was, I had graduated and I had played, you know, played, uh, had a chance to contribute uh, every year and the timing seemed right. And uh, so, yeah, I don't, I'm not a big guy to look back and say, what if, because who knows what would happen if I stayed or didn't stay, but, uh, I was happy for them because obviously those guys are um, all good friends of mine. And, you know, Todd Blackledge does a great job, and Kurt Warner, and I, you know, I was teammates with all those guys. So um, I was, you know, I couldn't tell how happy it was for them. Um, you know, for them, you know, because you know, our my senior year we were number one for X amount of years and you know, X amount of weeks, and then quite didn't finish get get it done that year. So I was happy that they were able to to do it the next year. So uh, I felt like even though you weren't there, you were part of it. Uh, anytime Penn State had success you feel like you're or or now you feel like you're a part of it one way or another but uh it was time for me to move on and and um you know into the draft and so uh no i mean i'm happy for them but i'm not really one that looks back and and gets all caught up in that i remember that 1982 draft because the bears drafted jim mcmahon one of the first drafts on espn but it's a lot different than it was then what was it like to get drafted waiting to get drafted by the oilers you know was um i was at penn state and um you know, the, the draft was on a Tuesday back then uh, during the week. It was 12 rounds, you know, six rounds and six rounds um, on Tuesday, Wednesday. And um, it started like 730 in the morning. Uh, so it's a lot different. And I think it just started being on TV like in 1980. It, right around that time, I think it was only a couple of years now that it had actually been live uh, broadcast on, on ESPN. Uh, so it was exciting. I mean, I, that's yeah, that was exciting. And uh, I went to my, uh, you know, I thought, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Obviously, like you mentioned, I moved up the, you know, I went to play in an all-star game, which helped me quite a bit um, move, you know, move up the, uh, that's why I always thought those all-star games are, are valuable. Um, I played in the Olympia Gold Bowl and uh, I remember Marcus Allen was in that, a bunch of us were in that. And um, I thought that helped me quite a bit in the combine. So I knew I was going to be, a, um, you know, I was, you know, proje- you know, your projections are always, you, know, you never know how they're going to work out, but I knew, you know, I was told I'd be in the first round type, you know, in that, in that area somewhere. So I thought, you know, this could be a long day, a long morning, but, uh, so I was at my girlfriend's, um, I went to her apartment so we could just kind of be by ourselves and not have anyone around, um, for that, you know, as they were doing, cause it was seven thirty in the morning. It wasn't, it was just so different than like now it's become such a big production and, you know, uh, looking back, I love you. Know, my dad, and my parents were two and a half hours away, but the night my dad was working, my mom was working. So, uh, it wasn't like uh, the, everyone was with me at the time, but um, so yeah, it was very. I mean, to sit there and have Pete Rosell, you know, come on the uh, the deal, and, and you, you you're sitting there, and you're, you know, some teams have talked to you, like you mentioned, McMahon went to, and I think he was like the sixth. I don't know what pick he was, sixth maybe, fifth or sixth. But um, and then uh, you know, team goes up there, and you know, okay, they're, they're not looking for offensive linemen. And I remember when Houston came up, I thought. You know, they had talked about a quarterback or an offensive lineman, but, you know, McMahon, you know, and plus the quarterback had just been drafted a couple of picks earlier or something. So I thought, oh, you never know. They could, and then, and then they hear your name called um, on TV because as my name was being called, the phone was ringing. And, you know, it was obviously the, the head coach of the of the, uh, of the Oilers then uh, to congratulate me. And I was hearing my name said on live on TV. And it's like, like it just, you know, you go off on a tangent, like, did this really happen? I mean, you're in a fog. It's like, you know, it's such a weirdest feeling to hear your name called and knowing that you just got picked by an NFL team to be, you know, to move on to the NFL level. So it's for a 21 year old man. It's, you know, it's, it's, it was really, really exciting. And, um, you know, you know, quite, uh, hard, hard to find the words to describe it really. And then to talk on the phone with, uh, you know, head coach and realize I'm going to be blocking for Earl Campbell. Uh, that was the first thought that came to my mind was, man, we blocking Pearl Campbell, man. <laughs> so I thought this, this is unbelievable. And uh, it was really exciting for me and my family. That was just a great moment for, you know, my family, you know, got hung up and went talk to them. They were all screaming, you know, and I have five sisters and they're all, you know, I'm the second oldest. So, was, you know, at the time we were all pretty young and 
so it was just a great family moment for um, you know someone from Scranton to go to you know first to go to Penn State, uh, which was a thrill, and then have an opportunity to play in the NFL was just you know it was you know, like a dream come true. So it was just a lot of excitement and um, happy for a lot of people and all the people that helped me along the trail with the high school, my high school team and my high school coach and Coach Paterno, Dick Anderson, the line coach that you know showed me, you know, taught me the position, which uh, I've always been so grateful for. He's he's such I thought he's the best line coach I've ever been around. So learned so much from them and they, they, they trained me for that moment. And I was just, um, yeah, I left Penn state with a degree and, uh, and, and, and a, uh, you know, a, uh, occupation, you know, they, they trained me to be a, a football, football player and, uh, a, you know, a businessman. And so, uh, you know, I can't thank Penn state enough for what they did for me. The Oilers in the early eighties started building a strong offensive line with you, Bruce Matthews, Dean Stein, Kohler. What was it like being part of that offensive line in the eighties? You know, uh, getting into the league, like you mentioned, I got to Houston, and, and you're right, they were uh, in the middle. That was the beginning of the of the uh, uh, building, the rebuilding of the team. You know, they had uh, battled the Steelers all through the 70s. Uh, unfortunately, the Steelers were building their dynasty at the same time. The Oilers were trying to, you know, they, they were the one-two punch in the AFC, and they, you know, unfortunately, you know, the Oilers kept coming in second. And so by the time we hit the early 80s, they were rebuilding, and, and they decided to do it through the offensive line, and uh, which was exciting to be part of that. And, and back then, like, the, you know, there was no free agency, so you knew you were going to probably be on the same team for your career pretty much unless they decide to trade you. So I thought, you know, like you mentioned, Bruce Matthews, Dean Stein, Kohler, uh, being part of the rebuilding, you know, they were tough years. I mean, my first year was a strike year. I came in the league and it was a strike, so we only played nine games. Uh, the second year was our first full year. We won two games, two and 14. Um, that's because re- that's what rebuilding brought you. And then when they got, you know, Warren Moon, you know, became a free agent out of Canada, you know, Warren went to Canada. I think when we got him, he was the, he was the biggest piece of the puzzle. You know, before he came there, we were building the O-line, and then he kind of came in, I think, in 84, 85. I think Warren came in, and uh, that was kind of – he was, like, the, the, obviously the most – you know, the quarterback is always the most important piece of the puzzle. And – you know, they were building it through the offensive line to be able to protect someone like him. And then I think that's what made it come together. But to be with Bruce and Dean, and we learned so much through those years when we weren't winning, you know, we were playing and growing as players, but uh, we knew we were going to be together for a long time. And hopefully we were, we were you know, developing something that we'd be able to win games for a lot of years. So, um, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was hard. It's hard to play in seasons like that, but I think because we're so young, and so excited about what we're doing that, um, you know, made us better players. And, they, you know, it was fun watching them continue to build the team uh, year in, year out through um, the draft because that was really the main way of building it and, you know, some trades here and there. But, uh, yeah, it was fun to be part of something from, from the ground level and watch us build it up to uh, a playoff team for, you know, seven years in a row. I remember watching those Bear Oiler games in the late 70s, early 80s. It was Earl Campbell right, Earl Campbell right, Earl Campbell up the middle. I mean, Houston ran the ball constantly. What was it like blocking for Earl? Well, it was exciting, like to come in and knowing that you know he um, that that's what the kind of team you're going to be part of. And even though we didn't have the rest of the pieces to win the games we like to, um, and for Lyman, uh, you just had to get the heck out of his way because he'd run you over too. I mean, he was. He was a downhill north and south runner, and uh, but, but faster than people thought. I mean, his size and everything was obvious. How the size of his legs and how hard he ran, and uh, so it was the, the, the block to be a lineman that type of offense is pretty much a dream come true. And because uh, you're running it rather than throwing it, and uh, and he was a great guy. I mean, he just was a you know from the day I got there, uh, he took everyone uh, under their under his wing and made them feel comfortable because uh, he was so laid back and. And uh, just, you know, was full of life, uh, you know, to be around and, you know, singing, he's a big country guy and singing songs on the, on the, on the airplane. He'd be singing over the intercom, singing different uh, Willie Nelson songs. And he just was, it was a very unique uh, time, you know, being in Texas, Houston, Texas, from a guy from Pennsylvania and being part of that and knowing that, yeah, we weren't winning yet, but uh, we were building something special. And to be around guys like him, Dave Casper, a lot of old, you know, some of the older guys that I watched on TV, um, you know, growing up, you know, you know, when I was, when I was at Penn State, you know, it's, it's weird when you go from college to pro and you're playing with players you watched, you know, guys that are 10 years older than you because 
obviously in high school and college, you don't have that, that difference in age. So the, when you go to the NFL, I always think that's kind of unique of all of a sudden your teammates with guys that, you know, you've watched play and, you know, you've, that are, you know, uh, household names. And all of a sudden now you are lining up and blocking for them or blocking with them or, so it's kind of it's kind of cool, and uh, so that I think that helped overcome not winning, because uh, obviously the goal is to win, and, and we knew we were building something, so the patience had to be there. And, and I think as they put the pieces the pieces of the puzzle together, um, like they did, it was exciting to know we were part of that. Uh, so we appreciated it much more when we um, when we start winning. Yeah, you mentioned I mean, you had some of the older guys like Earl Campbell, another Hall of Famer, Dave Casper, Robert Brazil, who should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah Robert Brazil was special, and hopefully this year he'll go in. And I mean, he's uh, Doctor Doom was, you know, uh, Rookie of the Year. He's All Pro. I think he's in the league. And I mean, yeah, he was. I mean, practices. Elvin Bethay, you know, you know, that's one of my first memories was Elvin. You know, Elvin was in his 16th year, I think, when I was in my first year. And uh, you know, I'm looking, I'm thinking, man, look at this old guy. And uh, you know, we're, I'm, we're pass blocking, and you know, he, he's he's out there playing defensive end, and. So I had a chance to go against him one on one, and I found out real quickly why he's been around 16 years. Um, you know his quickness, and I mean he he arm over me so fast. I, I was going, I was trying to kill him, and I figured I was this big rookie that was going to jump all over him. And uh, uh, unfortunately, um, I learned a couple quick lessons uh, about patience in the offense, you know, playing the offensive line position because of the way he, his quickness and how why he was so special. And you know, watching him, you know, being being his teammate for a couple of years. And then watching him going to the Hall of Fame, you know, knowing that I, when I came in the league, he was into his last couple of years. But, you know, to see what he was able to do and play with Earl Campbell, who went in the Hall of Fame, and Dave Casper, you know, seeing Dave Casper's work ethic, you know, when I came in the league, you know, seeing a tight end that played the game the way he did, uh, to experience that as a young player, and then, see, you know, to see those kind of guys early in my career really made, you know, made a difference on me to see how great guys prepared. Like, they didn't take it for granted. Uh, and that's why they're special. Every year was a new challenge in the NFL, and these guys were, old, you know, were, you know, at the at the back ends of their, you know, I was Archie Manning was a quarterback when I was there, so, you know. So I mean, I'm I'm around Archie Manning who I watched for years at New Orleans, and so um, that that to me is like a who's who. Like I'm sitting there looking through the program to see if all these guys are on, you know, you're part of this team now, and they're expecting you to help them win, and. Um, yeah, it was very, you know, that was, there's some great memories of, of being around those guys. And, and now, you know, we're in the Hall of Fame and uh, just really special to, to know that, you know, we were, you know, and I was hoping to see more of these guys, like you mentioned, uh, Robert Brazil, um, you know, get into the Hall of Fame because of what a great player he was. Um, and, you know, so I was around him for a handful, you know, for half of, you know, the second half of his career. So, you know, very exciting. Did you have any idea that Warren would become a Hall of Fame quarterback when he first came to the Oilers? I mean, I know you never think in those those levels, just like players don't. Like you know, um, they're, you're, you want to come into your best. I think that I think uh, watching his work ethic, um, you know, he's just his size, like how his built, his structure, how how strong he was, and seeing how hard he worked um, was. And obviously, he went to Canada because he wanted to play quarterback. And at those times, things were a little bit different. As far as you know, teams were I guess weren't buying into the fact that he maybe quarterback wasn't his best position. I think he stuck to his guns and what he believed in and what he felt he was capable of being. And obviously he proved it out. And I think that he obviously had, you know had some great great uh, great uh, career in Canada, which made him really one of the few one of the first uh, true free agents in the NFL. You know when he came in the NFL, like he had uh, he was being courted by a lot of teams. And obviously we were lucky to get him at, at Houston. And, uh, yeah, but I think when you watch, when he first came in and you saw, you know, he was, you know, his size, his strength, you know, how committed he was to the game, how hard he worked, uh, you knew he had something special. Uh, I didn't know where that was going to go. Um, but as far as we were concerned, me, Bruce, and Dino, uh, and uh, Harvey Salem, you know, was another second-round pick we had at the time. So the four of us, um, were, we've been, had been you know, together for a while, and I remember how, excited we were to thinking this guy's going has a chance to be really special and if he's special he'll make us you know he'll 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 make us finally turn us into a winning football team so i think that there's a lot of excitement in houston the day they got you know they got the warrant into, into houston and it proved out i mean this how he took it from you know what we were able to do and then you know you know dealing with the run and shoot offense um how well he adapted to that and uh, how well he ran that and 
I don't think people realize, um, you know, he was doing what Peyton Manning did years later, you know, calling all the plays, running, running the system, you know, calling a lot of his stuff, changing the runs, you know, going from run to pass. Uh, you know, him and Kevin Gilbride worked really well together. And, you know, watching that grow in the late 80s, early 90s was uh, special also. You go from Penn State where you ran the ball mostly, join the Oilers, you run the ball, and all of a sudden Moon comes there, and like you said, Kevin Gilbert, and you had that run and shoot. What was that like for you guys as offensive linemen to change the whole way you guys went about things? It took a while to adjust. I mean, it was a different, totally, like you mentioned, uh, it was really out of your comfort zone um, for linemen. Um, and it wasn't run and shoot where the ball's out quick. I mean, they adjusted to where um, – you know, straight drop back, maybe or maybe uh, the, the hardest part was for us was figuring out where the quarterback was throwing the ball from. Uh, we were so used to the quarterback always being, you know, seven yards deep, five-step drop right behind the center. And all of a sudden you went to an offense that uh, he was going to be in a lot of different spots. And, you know, sometimes he was going to be in the conventional seven-yard, you know, uh, drop spot. And then other times he may be a little bit over the left guard or maybe a little bit over the right guard or maybe rolling out or – so it made the defense, made them have to work a little bit so they couldn't always be design blitzes and line stunts to, to attack the quarterback. So that was, there were was some positives to it. But the other fact was you had to realize where he was. And that took a while to figure out because you think you're blocking your guy. Next thing you know, he's reaching over and grabbing. I'm thinking, what's this guy doing? And he'd be grabbing the quarterback and he's sitting right there. I thought the quarterback was in a different location. So I think that was probably some of the earlier times of us getting used to that. But uh, and knowing the fact that we were going to throw the ball, um, quite a bit, which obviously defensive linemen and, and people, that's what they want. They want the opportunity to rush the passer like that. So it was a whole different mindset. Now, we still ran the ball a lot. You know, we still had 1,000-yard rushers, you know, with Mike Rozier and Alan Pinkett and, and guys like that. And uh, um, so we we had some uh, good years. We still had back, you know, Alonzo Highsmith uh, running the football. Um, but obviously the passing was what, what set it up, the pass set the run rather than run set the pass. And it put a lot of Warren. I mean, Warren really had to be on his game week in, week out, uh, because so much of what we were doing um, was on him. And then other, the other thing was it was hard to prepare for games because we didn't uh, – teams – we were us in Detroit. Now, it was us first, and then Detroit uh, went to the same system. There was very little film, so when you were going to play someone, you had no idea how they were going to play you. If we were going to play the Steelers or the, uh, the Browns or the Bengals, the teams in our division at, at that time, you had no idea how they were going to play the run because no, you couldn't watch the film of other teams playing it because nobody was doing it. So it was hard, you know. So then you had, really you were adjusting uh, during the game, uh, you know, after you saw how they were going to uh, uh, play your team with four wide receivers because that was something new to the league, really. Not too many teams were, were, were doing to the level we were. So it did, it, for, for preparation, it was very uh, much more difficult because uh, we had to prepare on the run more. Uh, on the move, you know, whether it be game day or, you know, we had an idea what teams were going to do, but until we played a lot of teams more than one time, uh, we didn't, we really didn't know what to expect. So um, that added another element of uncomfortableness for, for players, especially offensive linemen, you know, routes are routes, you know, but for us, you know, what we had to do and deal with versus the different looks we can see, different blitzes we can see, there was a lot more to it. So I think it, it grew us as players. I think we, it helped Bruce and I, I think it helped our careers, it helped us adapt, learn how to adapt to things, learn how to communicate, just, just to change our technique. You know, so it was, you know, it was a uh, learning process, but I think it helped us become better players. Who was the toughest defensive lineman you faced? The toughest defensive lineman? Yes. Uh, um, early in my career, right when I came to the league, it was probably Randy White. Um, you know, we had the big game with Houston Dallas every year. You know, back then preseason was was a little more big deal than it is now. Uh, the fourth preseason game was like your like like it was like the first game of the season really, uh, and we had the big uh, showdown with uh, you know in in Dallas every year, and it was a nationally televised game. And John Madden was doing it, so he knew it was a big deal if John was doing the game. So, you know, I think playing them every year in that game and me going against Randy White the first couple times, and you know he was at he was kind of not not he was kind of on the on the back end of his career, but still playing still a top, you know, one of the best in the league. And obviously there, there's another example of a guy I watched, you know, win Super Bowls and play well and two tall Jones and, you know, that whole group of guys they had, um, you know, that was probably, you know, playing against a guy like that was as physical, as quick, and as strong as he was, was something I never really experienced in college. And so he was kind of my first taste of this is, whoa, this, this is the level of play 
<laughs> that uh, that I'm going to be dealing with every Sunday because that was one of my first starts in the NFL. It was a preseason game, a rookie year, and so that was my first taste of greatness of going against someone like him. Um, and then obviously, then same thing would happen as I went. But he'd be the guy that probably stood out for me because I think when you're young, you know, and playing against a guy that obviously ends up being a Hall of Famer, um, it's something you always remember. You were in, played in one of the most famous uh, playoff games in history, the comeback. What was it like that game? I mean, did you guys think we have this game won, and all of a sudden the Bills came out of nowhere? And did you think, what the hell is going on here? Yeah, we did think we had. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah, we we played about as good as, as good as first half as a team could play on the road uh, against Buffalo, who had who, who obviously had a great defense. You know, Bruce Smith, Tally. I mean, they had a who's who on defense. And uh, we went up there. I think we scored 31 points in the first half. Uh, four, I think we had the first four times we scored touchdowns, and then I think a field goal. And I think I think that's what I can. I guess I'm, I'm, I try to block out some of the bad memories that week. <laughs> But I, what I remember was we, we were going up and down the field. Everything we did worked. Um, you know, Warren was couldn't have thrown the ball any better. We were blocking. We ran the ball when we wanted to. Everything was, you know, 31 to 3 or whatever it was at halftime. Um, so, yeah, definitely. I, we, I thought at halftime we thought this was, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're playing at the level we're supposed to play at. The, the run and shoot was clicking as good as it could be clicking. So, yeah, we were – I mean, I, I mean, I know I was thinking it. I mean, I, not that we were – you know, we thought the – we knew that we had to play a whole second half, but obviously we we uh, felt uh, very strong about our position. And and then the second half happened, unfortunately, and it was almost like obviously the total opposite. And I think, you know, from onside kicks to balls bouncing the wrong way to, you know, Warren threw some good balls and it bounced off the receiver and they got an interception. And I think they scored almost 17 points before we um, got the ball at one point, you know, between – they drove down and scored. Then they kicked an outside kick and got the ball and scored again. And then we threw one ball. I think he got intercepted. They got tipped and returned reception. So we had one play, and I think they scored 21 points in, in the third quarter. So you knew it was going to be a game. I mean, when that happened, obviously, um, game on, obviously. And then we really, you know, it's an avalanche. You know, obviously, it didn't go our way. We It still was a tie. It still was overtime. So I thought we'd still overcome all that and still win the football game, even though we – you know, we, they kicked a field goal to send it to overtime. Um, you know, I mean, we obviously thought we were still going to win the football game, and we didn't. And, you know, so then you get the, the, the worst part. We're not only going through it one time, but you have to live with it the rest of your life because every time the playoffs are about to start, they start playing that game over again. So it's one of those things where it's a memory I really don't want to have to relive, but unfortunately it seems like some of the people go, oh, yeah, I saw you in the game. I saw you. I'm thinking, that was, wasn't that long enough? Why do I keep playing that game? Uh, but – yeah, it's a not it's not a great memory, and it was a um, you know credit to them. You know they were a great football team. You know they went to four Super Bowls in a row back in that time, and Jim Kelly wasn't even playing. You know so we have no excuse. I mean, you know it wasn't like you say, oh Jim man, Jim really, you know you know Frank Wright uh, he led the charge, and obviously he did a great job. You know yeah, I, I, as the quarterback that day, and things just I mean as bad as it wasn't as bad as good as we were in the first half, and as bad as they were, we, it's amazing we flipped roles and. And they somehow made enough plays to beat us. So yeah, that was very. Uh, that was, that's why I was so happy about when I was um, coaching. When I went to coaching, and then uh, the Music City Miracle was against Buffalo. So that was kind of my. That was my settling grace that that, that day was us. It was the we were the Titans at the time, which obviously we were the Oilers. But uh, on that day, it was against Buffalo, and, uh, and I remember that, that that I got reminded because I think Buffalo got in the playoffs this year for the first time since that game. Uh, since the Music City Miracle. So um, that was kind of my payback for me as a player and a coach was the uh, return the favor in a, in a very memorable way. At least the pressure's off you now after that Super Bowl last year with Atlanta. Now everyone's talking about how Atlanta blew that Super Bowl. And I'm sure Bruce yeah. was talking to Jake about it and saying, listen, I went through that for 25 years, people talking about it. Yeah, I think he probably, unfortunately, he probably had that kind of face. Because, yeah, <laughs> anytime I see a loss, I kind of hope, like, I hope this one's worse than ours. So they'll talk about this one instead of ours. You know, it's like someone that makes the crucial error in the World Series, or like it's something that it's just this, you know, this uh, you know, cause it's so unbelievable. And there's been obviously great comebacks, but uh, yeah, that was that was you know obviously for Super Bowls that's going to be the so that's that's the Super Bowl that'll be the most memorable for that. And ours is still going to be the play, the playoff game. Like they, I wish they were just like you said, uh, let's just stick with the play, the Super Bowl and forget the playoff game. 
let's let's put that baby to rest. When did you know that you had a chance to make the Hall of Fame? Yeah, I don't know if you ever do. I, I mean, I, I think it's the same thing. Like once you're you're done playing and you start thinking about your career, and you, again you see others going to the Hall of Fame, um, you think. I mean, I, I don't know for Lyman you ever. Th- I mean, other than maybe Bruce and a couple of re- Lyman, for Lyman especially, because it's not like you have obvious stats that are going to be Hall of Fame worthy, like a quarterback or uh, maybe a running back or a, a D lineman with sacks or whatever it is, but. I think for us, you know, you know, other than like I mentioned Bruce because my teammate and my best friend, you know, he plays 19 years and doesn't miss a game. I mean, that's he's a no-brainer. I mean, he did something no one else in the history of the, the, the league did at that time. So, I mean, someone like him is, you know, obviously the rarest of the rare and well-deserving. And, and But for someone like me that's, you know, played 12 years, um, you know, I, I felt I played at a high level. You don't – I never really even gave any thought to it personally. Um until like you get told you're in the finalist and then you get something in the mail. And again, it wasn't the production it is today. It wasn't. I love the way that they've, they're bringing the attention to it now. I love the way they're handling it now. I think it's awesome. You know, um, you know, the, the way they, you know, it's such a big part of Super Bowl weekend and for the players that are going in, it's, you know, just, just, they do a really nice job with it now, I think. And, and, but I even, I mean, it was great then. I mean, when you're told you won the finalist, I think that's when you, it hits you. I mean, I don't think until that moment, you know, if you get something in the mail saying you won the 15 finalists, because I mean you're on the big list, or the big list that comes out that's 100 plus probably. Even that's exciting. You know, oh yeah, your name was on the list. I mean, to even be considered for that is just unbelievable. I mean, for all the guys that played in the league, and you know, obviously there's, there's guys that many many guys that should be in the Hall of Fame that aren't there yet, and maybe at some point will be, because there's been a lot of great players. So there's no perfect system, and never will be for you know choosing these things. Because people always get overlooked, uh, you know, there's no doubt about that, and hopefully that gets corrected uh, as time goes on. But um, for me to be on a list, any list, even when I was on the the, the originals that come out when they when they have a bunch of guys, and then that was that in itself was you know, like this is awesome. And then and you, and you never feel worthy. I know I never will. You know, when I when I go back every year and and um, get you know be part of that weekend, and you realize what a fraternity it is. I mean, it's just. Wow, you know, it's like whoa, and, you know, it, you know, that's, it, you know, so that, I never really gave any thought to it until I got on the, 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 you know, I made those lists at the end, and then you know, then made the the finalist list, and then then obviously you realize, geez, this could miss, I'm really in in play here, and uh, you know, you're still sh- shocked by the list you're on that you're you're actually one of the names on that list. I mean, it's just, just very humbling and very. Uh, you know, rewarding that you know the people would look at your career in that way. So I, that's how for Lyman especially. I mean, we're the guys that you know are you know, maybe a little bit harder to um, you know to figure out you know who goes in, who should go in. So it's it was very um, when I went through that process a couple of times, it was just very humbling and um, unexpected, and but very much appreciated, obviously, and so pretty awesome. When you found out you went in the Hall of Fame, what was it like? Um, I mean, you know, I remember the day forever. Obviously, you know, we we at that time we didn't go like now. They have you down the Super Bowl. Um, I was at, I was at home in Nashville. I was coached at the time. I mean, I was a coach for the uh, the Titans. Um, I knew I was on the final 15. Um, you know, I talked to John McClain. John was my uh, there was the uh, was the reporter that, that represented me. I, you know, obviously, every player has a representation from their NFL city that is kind of reminding people of your you know the process on that day. So. We had talked to you know when the time got close about all that and and uh, you know expectations were what they are you, you know you got a shot and that was about it and so um, he told me give me a call um, that was that Saturday actually my daughters had um, my, my daughter was playing basketball in the wide league on that Saturday you know I think we had a, I think the game was at noon or whatever and so I think John told me hey this we'll probably have a meeting we'll probably make an announcement by 11 11 o'clock on that Saturday. And so uh, I'll call you uh, as soon as I know something either way. And so, um, so I quietly was um, thought, well, the basketball game will keep, will keep uh, me busy and keep this off my mind. And we're not going to make a big production out of it. My, and my daughters, both my daughters were, uh, you know, young, you know, fifth grade, you know, younger at the time. So they weren't, I didn't want to get everyone all caught up in it. So we kind of just played low key. And so we we're getting ready for going to that. And I feel like I saw the, the clock and thought, man, they're not, I didn't hear anything, so I thought that meant obviously I didn't make it. So I wasn't giving much thought to it. So I said I didn't turn the TV on and see who made it. 
so I turned the TV on and I found ESPN and they said, um, they said, yeah, the, um, uh, the, you know, they've been delayed and they haven't made, you know, it hasn't been announced yet. The team hasn't been announced yet. They'll be announcing it in the next few minutes. And I hadn't heard from John yet. So I figured, well, you know, I'm going to wait and see who made it then. And so I sat down and my, you know, my daughters were getting ready for the game and I was in the room by myself. And, uh, they, uh, they came out, uh, from the, the director of the whole thing came out and, they started announcing the names, and um, that's how I heard it on TV. I mean, I was, uh, of course, they said this is, this is in a random order. And I think um, Marv Levy may have been first, or Nick Bonacani was maybe the first. Uh, like, I don't even remember. It became such a wet, and then a third or fourth name was mine. And, you know, just to hear, I mean, just wow. I mean, just to hear, to sit there and hear that, um, like I, didn't, I couldn't believe I heard it. And at the same time, again, just like when I got drafted by the, you know, when I got signed with the, or got drafted by the Oilers, the phone was ringing and it was, it was John and uh, telling me that screaming in the phone and uh, how happy he was. And, um, you know, that, that, you know, about the Hall of Fame. And so then the family came in and, and uh, they, you know, my wife was jumping around and we were, you know, the whole bit, I mean, just the excitement, like you wouldn't, you couldn't imagine just a great family moment again, like that I, I had back with, you know, that when I just almost like when I came in the league and got drafted, uh, just what a, what do you say is something like that. I mean, it's just, uh, it's a memory. It's an unbelievable experience and memory and the fact that, you know, that happened and then obviously the phone rings off the hook after that for the next 24 hours of people and, and really a lot of people that were a big part of my career and the, big, and the reason why I was in that position to um, to be in the hall, whether it be high school level, college level, friends, family, just all, you know, and that's why I like this can thing because I think it's what a celebration it is and people – all the people that were part of it have an opportunity to come to Canton to experience it with you because they experienced they experienced your career and what a great way to do it. That's why that that weekend is so special because not just it's not about you, it's about you know everybody, you know the, your family and you know everybody that was part your football family, your media family, your you know, your Penn State family, your high school family. You know, there's so many people that affect the, um, that result. So. Just you know, and but to go back there every year, and re, you know, bring back that memory is just awesome. So I, I just love the way it's set up. I love being part of it. I love going back. I love knowing, you know, getting to know different Hall of Famers every year. You you kind of get a chance to visit with different guys, and you see how much we, you know, you see how much guys are so much alike. You know, even though we're so different in our backgrounds, you see how look their drive, their passion for the game, their their way of thinking, their you know, different backgrounds, different everything, but man, so much in common with that, you know, the love of the game uh, and then trying to be difference makers um, with that over the years, whether in the communities and and going forward. And I think this, that's the, the neat thing that, you know, we're all in this together and you feel like yeah, you're part of something really, really special. Was it tough coaching players once you got in the Hall of Fame? Did players think of you a different way or did they – Say so you played a long time, but you know what you're talking about, or did they have more respect for you being how great of a player you were? Well, I think if you put, yeah, I think they, I think you put Hall of Fame, like when people get to go that they hear you're a Hall of Famer, um, it, there's no doubt it adds um, the, the respect card. I mean, there's no way around that, but I think it just gives you more, um, uh, they, because, you know, obviously most people don't know, fish as now that as I'm older and older. Uh, people aren't going to remember me playing football. If I say Mike Munchak, you know, not many people are going to go, oh, yeah, you're the guy from the Oilers. I mean, obviously, for an offensive lineman, you you say, well, yeah, he's a Hall of Famer. Well, then, you know, people maybe know nothing about my career, but they say, well, geez, this guy must have been really good. Um, I think in, in as far as coaching goes, um, I think it's just it gets you in the door. It's like it gives you respect. Yeah, they're going to respect that fact. But if I can't make them better players, or I'm not good at my job uh, to make them better, then it's it, that's going to fade away real quick. Um, yeah, they'll respect what I accomplished in my career, but I still have to coach these guys. So hopefully, they, you know, again, the same old thing. Just because you played the game and you were good at the game doesn't mean you can coach the game uh, or teach the game because it, you know, you, you know, you have to be a teacher. And so there's, it doesn't guarantee anything. Uh, it just tells them that you know um, that I had a good, solid career. That's how I look at it that they can just say, hey, man, this guy must have been a good player. Uh, I don't use it. I don't think it's something that is going to define me. I think it's just something that, you know, no, knows that hey, I played in the league and I, you know, I did the best I could with what, you know, during that time. And so I think players, the players are going to respect that. Just like when you say, you know, you want a Super Bowl ring or you got 
I mean, there's a lot of respect that comes. People understand how hard it is to play this game, and when you have success in this game, that you know that just adds another level to it. I think, and whatever it may be, whether it be Pro Bowls, you know, or you know, All Pros or championships or you know, then the Hall of Fame thing, you know, just all that stuff, obviously, for people that play the game and can appreciate the hard work that goes into all those type of things. And really, to me, it's anyone that plays in the league. If you play in this league and you're on a roster, then you've made a lot of sacrifice. You've done you've done a lot to be in that position. So for me, it's not necessarily – the Hall of Fame thing doesn't add anything as far as – I mean, don't get me wrong. It's an honor that's, you know, unbelievable. And um, But, if, you know, for, as far as coaching, um, I think the fact that I played in the league means a lot to players – and the fact that you have success means more, you know, adds a little bit. And then as you add things like, you know, hey, I've been in the Super Bowl, I know what that means, or I've been to the, I've been in the playoffs, I know that, or I played your position. You can just relate to the guys more. It, just, it gives you a little, a little help there. But obviously, it still comes down to being a good coach. And obviously, there's a lot of guys that didn't play in the NFL that are great coaches. Um, you know, that coach is as good as anybody. So um, it's not a prerequisite, but it just, I think, it just adds a little, like you mentioned, a little respect factor that. You, I may get a little more um, leeway uh, for a little longer uh, in my coaching ability because they feel, hey, this guy played the game, understands the game, so I'm going to listen a little bit longer, and hopefully I can, you know, hopefully I'll impress him or I'll teach him and, or help him in a way that I was helped, you know, by others. So I, I think that's that's the beauty of why I like coaching because, for me, I love talking to other players at other positions, uh, which I have done for over the years, and kind of ask pick their brains on how why they are successful you know, for, especially for linemen, like talking for me to talk to Anthony Munoz or talk to Mike Webster, you know, to talk to guys like that, that over the years have had been great players, but do it different ways. And, you know, I, I use a lot of their thoughts. I, I try to teach, you know, some of the things they've done. I, you know, Dwight Stevenson at center, you know, when I was playing, I remember going to the Pro Bowl and picking their brain on how you do this, what you think it is. And, and really, I, I coach a lot of that way. I coach from a lot of the the uh, input I've gotten from, uh, you know, O-line uh, guys that have been pro bowlers or Hall of Famers. So now when I go down there for a Hall of Fame weekend, I'm asking those guys a lot of different questions. Hey, how'd you do this guy? How'd you play a guy that was like this? What were you thinking there? And, and a lot of times it's great information that I'll incorporate into my coaching style and, and hopefully pass on to my players and, uh, and go back and tell stories to my guys about these guys, you know, experiences, what they overcame, you know, what made them great, what pushed them to be, who they were, and I, I you know, because I'm big into the history of the game, and understanding the tradition of the game, and respecting the guys that played the game before us, and realize what a humbling game it is, and how it's an honor, you know, it's an honor and a privilege to be part of this league, whether it be a player or a coach, uh, whatever it is, and no matter what level you play at. So, I enjoy, um, you know, so the Hall of Fame and those weekends and being part of this group has given me a lot of ammunition and, and great material that I could pass on to the young players of today. And then those guys love the stories. They love hearing it. They, they love to be educated on, on, on players and who they are and what they did. And they love the stories. So I love, I love um, passing them on. One last thing I would have loved to have been in those meetings when you were coaching Bruce Matthews, when you're coaching the Titans, that'd be interesting. You're giving Bruce Matthews advice. <laughs> yeah, I was. Well, it seemed like I, um, you know, I got him. I, well, I, you know, I always tell him if it wasn't for me, he wouldn't make the Hall of Fame. <laughs> um, you know, his last seven years, I got I got a chan- chance to coach him, so I, I always try to take credit for him. Um, obviously, that um, that's you know, obviously I had nothing to do with it, but other than, but the fact I think I always try to say he played 19 years, and I saw I saw every play he ever played, uh, which is hard to uh, for anyone else to say, I guess. But no, he he it was uh, very unique for he and I. What a relationship in the NFL, and you know, he introduced me into the Hall of Fame, and I introduced him into the Hall of Fame, and. Yeah, we were each other's presenters, and, and you know our families are like uh, fa- you know like you know, my my daughters are you know like like daughters to him, and I feel his kids feel like they're like I'm uh, I'm you know same thing part of the family, and so we have a very unique relationship uh, that's rare that we were, we were you know we we're blessed to be um, you know good friends, good teammates uh, for a long time, and uh, yeah, coaching him was it was just uh, it was interesting the way to do it, but I think it was. You know, I you know, made me a better coach, and uh, you know, coaching someone like him, and, and you learn how to coach the good one, you know, the, the special guys and the regular guys, and all the different types of players you deal with. And so, we, yeah, I thought I thought he handled it a very professional way, also, because it's not easy to coach guys that you were teammates with, and it doesn't happen very often, but it does does come up at times. And so, yeah, it was a very uh, great time in my life, uh, 
to have him in. And then, you know, then actually to coach with him for a while, a couple of years back uh, was unique too. So we've had, um, we've had, a, you know, obviously a great NFL relationship and, and, uh, and to, you know, we're obviously best friends. So uh, he was very, he's been very helpful to me, not only to my career, but on my coaching career. Cause it was great. I'd be able, we'd be in a meeting and I'd say, like, I'm trying to coach up this great technique and I, Usually I go overboard with, uh, you know, trying to teach it. I look at him and he'd go, man, you can't do that. We, 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 we can't, you know, he, 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 he'd bring me back to reality that, uh, you know, something I, something I was trying to teach wasn't really it was a little more too, a little more difficult than I thought it was. So he gave me that look like, no, man, that's not, that's not happening. So uh, he brought, he kept me uh, grounded, I think, on not getting too carried away with my coaching. So especially as I was learning the trade, you know, as I was learning that, because that was my early years, my, you know, that was my first years as being a coach was, um, you know, during that time when he was still playing. So, uh, he helped me, you know, just helped me adjust, uh, as a coach too. It kind of gave me great feedback, you know, what better way to, to, to coach and get honest feedback from a, from a player that's it's in the room listening. So, uh, he, you know, he was very helpful to me getting started because I would, I keep adjusting my uh, teaching style and, uh, you know, what I said and didn't say, and maybe my routine by a lot of the input he gave me. So, um, you know, that I, there was a big, it was more of a, you know, it was a big advantage to have, to have the ability to coach him. So who taught the Mantis kids how to hold you or their dad? I taught them the technique. He taught them how to cheat. So I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to leave it to him. No, I think we've already, he did a great job with his boys and I love being part of lives and the, the fact that Jake's still playing and I got the opportunity to coach Kevin and Mike, you know, so I, you know, as a coach, I had Kevin on my roster for a few years in Tennessee and, he, you know, he he turned out to be, you know, not had a really nice career. And then Mikey, I was able to coach um, his, his one of his younger sons uh, last year. Until you know, he had, he got uh, actually hurt his knee uh, during training camp. And then Jake, I've never I've been around Jake a ton, but obviously I take no credit. I take no credit for any of them, especially Jake. I mean, obviously he's turned into a great football player. But Bruce has done a great job uh, with with all of them and his boys. And I've just been blessed to be around, be part of that. And you know, in around Clay, you know. Yeah, you know, I got to know Clay real well from you know even when we had to play against him in Cleveland. Um, you know Clay Senior. Um, so like I feel like I'm a big part of that. You know knowing him so well and his family well with Clay Jr. doing so well at Green Bay, uh, and his other son who was a linebacker I think for the Eagles for a while. So yeah, just be part of that family. You know they're they're so special in what they've accomplished all all of them. And you know I've been very blessed to be part of that. And, you know I feel like I'm, I'm part of that their family just because I've been around them so long and and seeing how those guys. Um, handle things. So yeah, it's been very unique experience.